I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And we're beginning this hour talking about a couple that a lot of a lot in common with with Amber and Johnny. And Amber and Johnny, you watched the trial here on, on Court TV, had this very volatile relationship, toxic relationship, violent relationship. And it was up to a jury to figure out who was telling the truth, who was the aggressor, who was the victim, et cetera. And we saw how that one uh, turned out. The, the jury uh, came to the conclusion that Amber Heard was the aggressor. She was not the victim of domestic violence in that relationship. So now we're talking about two people, um, Courtney Clenny and Christian Obamselli. Um, here they are together. They weren't married, uh, but they were a couple that lived together. Uh, she was an OnlyFans model. Those of you not familiar with OnlyFans, you pay a monthly fee and you can see uh, people doing things that they can't do on other websites like Instagram or Facebook, okay? I'll leave it at that. Um, so in this case, there again are these allegations kind of going back and forth. There's also a civil case in, in, in addition to the uh, criminal case. Now the criminal case is a murder case. She's accused of murdering him. He's dead. He was stabbed, and she's claiming self-defense, and she's the victim of, of Christian Obamselli. So you have the attorneys on both sides here pointing the, the fingers at each other. On, on one side, you've got the uh, attorneys um, representing the Obamselli family. Um, the attorney, Kimberly Wald, she's on the left side of the screen, and on the right side of the screen are Courtney Clenny's defense attorneys, um, Frank uh, Pietro, Prieto and uh, Sabrina Puglasi. So there have been some videos that have been released. This is the most famous one that we've seen many, many, many times. This is a, an elevator that goes directly up to the $12,000 a month apartment or condo that they were renting down in Miami. When I say they, it's really she was renting because she was the one making the money. She was the one paying the bills. Now, in this video, she's punching him a lot, and we've seen that. And we've had the defense on to explain uh, this, and they say that she was trying to get away from him, and this elevator would take her straight up to the apartment, and he followed her in there. And that's what's really going on here. You be the judge. Well, now we've got another new video that's been released. This comes to us uh, from the law firm representing the family of Christian Ovimselli. Um, the young man who's dead, who was stabbed by Courtney Clenny. And take a look at a look and a listen at this video. And again, you be the judge of what's going on in this relationship, because ultimately a jury will have to figure out what's going on in this relationship and what happened on the day that Christian Obamselli died. Let's take a look. Anyway, you know, like I was sober for two weeks. Your man's. 
lying. Trying to come home with me. You're lying. No, I'm not. You're lying. She said, come get your man. Said, I was trying to hit on my line. Come on, baby. Okay. That doesn't even no, sound right. Like, Christian, I, you're fired. Fine. Hopefully. Fine. Shut up. You'll never see me again. You are the most good. Now remember, this is all happening in front of someone who's recording it. Uh, I think they're secretly recording it. Um, I don't think they necessarily know, but they're doing it they knowingly in front of someone. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I see and hear in, in that video. I hear someone who's got two million followers on Instagram and is making seven figures and is really, really insecure in, in her relationship with Christian Obenselli. I mean, he's not making the money. She's making all the money. They're living this lifestyle because of her. Yet she's very seemingly insecure in all of this. And when they get into these arguments, every video I've seen, she's slapping and, and punching him. Now, here's uh, um, what her defense team has released in response to uh, this video. This video is an example of the toxic relationship between Oban Sally and Courtney Clenny. Evidence exists that Oban Sally physically abused Courtney on prior occasions. And on April 3rd, 2022, Courtney was forced to defend herself from Oban Sally's physical attack. So if that evidence exists, it's going to be extremely important and significant at the trial. Because so far, what's been released, and again, this is coming from the law firm representing his family, um, nothing makes her look good. So far, everything I've seen and heard makes her look like the violent one or the more violent one in the relationship. And there is evidence that she stabbed him before the day that she fatally stabbed him. So I don't know. I, we'll, we'll see at the trial what this other evidence is. Um, by the way, tomorrow, big day here on Court TV tomorrow morning. Um, one of Courtney's defense attorneys, someone from the team, looks like it's going to be Sabrina, will join uh, Julie Grant on opening statements. That's uh, tomorrow morning right here on your front row seat to justice. Make sure you check that out. In the meantime, uh, Courtney Clenny does have a status hearing tomorrow, so that'll be important as well. So let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy, also with us in Phoenix, Arizona, the lawyer who represented Jody Arias, does not like her, Kirk Nurmi, and in Los Angeles, California, president of the West Coast Trial Lawyers and former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. Okay, <clears throat> Eklund Mercy, I know this is a significant issue um, for you as well. Um, you know, in, in our system is that there are a lot of victims of, of, of trafficking that exist, obviously. You know, we, we are both in Atlanta, which is one of the epicenters of all of this. Her attorney has alleged that she's a victim of sex trafficking by him. In that video, I just heard her say, you're fired. So... Yeah. Are you allowed to fire the person who is sexually trafficking you? Or, or, or is that indicative of the nature of this relationship? Who's really in charge? I don't know. What, what, what do you think? I think her, her tax bracket kind of takes that argument away. And the fact that she actually has um, control over, over the funds. I believe that um, the issue is, is that we have a abusive relationship in which the man is 
is not the breadwinner and essentially is at the beck and call of the aggressor, which is the female in this in in this relationship. It's gonna be, I, I, I can see what the defense is trying to do, but it's gonna be a really, really steep hill to climb based on who makes the money. Kurt, Nermi, um, the nature of this relationship is everything for this case, for this trial, for the jury to understand what is going on. And again, we haven't seen all the evidence. Uh, I know the, the defense uh, has their own evidence that they're going to present in this case. It's a self-defense case. But from what I'm seeing and hearing, it, it just seems like she is in charge, right? And, and she, as Eklund pointed out, she controls the, the purse strings here. She's the breadwinner. She's the one making all the money. And every time the cameras are rolling, he's the one getting hit. Yeah, this evidence, Vinny, is very damning. Obviously, we've shown both videos now. It's very damning for Ms. Kalani. But if you're, and, and one thing I heard there this time, and if I was the prosecutor, I'd certainly be enhancing the audio to make sure it conveys to the jury. She blamed him for losing money, and she blamed him for some other issues in her, her in sobriety or falling off the wagon. And to me, when she has to take the stand, because she's going to have to in a self-defense case, blaming him, her pattern of blaming him is certainly something the prosecutors should bring up right away. But if you're the defense, you have to say, look, and you better have some forensics to back it up, right? Because she's obviously going to get on the stand and, and say her story. She's going to attack him. But the question becomes, do they have the forensic evidence to back it up? Is there something about the crime scene that day that can show that she was, in fact, on the defense? That's really going to be where this case lies. That's going to be her only hope because nothing that we've seen so far demonstrates that she has an ounce of hope of convincing the jury of her self-defense claim. Now, the only thing that I've seen so far, some body camera footage, Nima Romani, from the day before, uh, um, Christian is killed, is stabbed to death by her. Um, they have a big blowout. And they, they were having a lot of fights in, in this building. And this building is a very expensive building. And people were complaining. They were close to getting kicked out. They didn't own the unit. They were renting it, 12, 000, about $12,000 a month, I believe. Um, but in this video that you're looking at right here, she's talking to police about wanting a restraining order against him. Now... To me, that is uh, significant and could be the foundation of, of part of their defense and what is taking place in this relationship. Um, but she's the one who's, I think, on the lease for the, for the, for the home they were living in. How, how significant do you think that evidence could be pitted against these videos that we're watching where he's the one taking a, a beating? Well, Vinny, the video in the elevator in the apartment are a lot more significant. You know, obviously, look, this is good for the defense, but the question is, is it going to come in? It's hearsay. So the defense is going to try to put it in. Um, the fact that she's on the lease, look, if you want to kick someone out, you file an unlawful detainer. You don't stab them. So, you know, if you look at the facts in this case, they're strongly in favor of the prosecution. Really, the only thing... The three things that she has going for her are Florida juries, they love a good self-defense case. She's an attractive female defendant and the victim is black. I mean, but if you look at the facts and the law, this should be a layup prosecution for the state. Yeah, but she, she was not eating popcorn, so she cannot use that defense, which we saw done successfully here on Court TV. Ekla Mercy, Kirk Dermy, Nima Romani, with us the whole hour, up next. Florida police say Franklin Tucker and an accomplice crashed a ramshackle structure known as the Treehouse, wearing masks to rob their target. Now, Tucker is on trial for his role in a Treehouse home invasion. She was a sweet girl, loving mother. Erica Stefanko stands accused of luring a pizza delivery driver into a trap that ended her life. We believe it was her that made the phone call to order the pizza. During the delivery, Ashley was ambushed by her former boyfriend. She was found guilty, but that conviction has been overturned. Now, will a new trial end with a different verdict? The pizza delivery murder retrial. Live coverage begins Tuesday morning, only on Court TV.
November 17, 2017. Two masked men go to a local drug hangout called the Treehouse near Key West to rob a woman named Paula Belmont. Two people came bowing up the stairs. One jumped on me immediately, slit my neck, telling me that if I didn't give him the money, he was going to kill me. As she was being held at knife point, Matthew Bonnet rushed to help her and was stabbed to death on the steps. As these two people were going down the stairs, my landlord Matthew came up the stairs and Rory Detroit Wilson, the one who slit my neck, started to take off his mask and Matthew saw it and that's when he got stabbed and murdered. Rory Wilson and Ty Tucker were arrested and accused of targeting Belmont as payback for a drug deal gone wrong. I know about the treehouse and I know what went down there, but I had somebody tell me about it today. Wilson was convicted of murder and robbery in 2022. A third man, Travis Johnson, who drove Wilson and Tucker to the treehouse, pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. Two years after his arrest, while he was being housed at the Monroe County Jail, Tucker reconnected with his high school girlfriend, Lauren Janai, the co-founder of CrossFit. She was gorgeous. Did you have a crush on her? Oh yeah, oh yeah, instantaneously. I got stupid real quick. Inside Edition cameras were in court when Janai went to bail her new boyfriend out of jail. He's not a murderer, I know him. He's not somebody who would do that kind of thing. They married in 2020, and Tucker lived with Janai in Oregon as he awaited his trial. Tucker is facing multiple charges, including murder, robbery, and aggravated assault. He has maintained his innocence since 2017 and claims that he's being framed by the Monroe County Sheriff's Office. The captain who was in charge of the in charge of the investigation, she's in trouble for some racist comments she made on on in one of the videos. In September 2023, Tucker successfully petitioned the court to dismiss his attorneys and allow him to represent himself at trial. Unbelievable turnaround, right? You look at that mug shot and then you see what he looks like now. And then today you see and hear him in the courtroom representing himself. Like, it, no resemblance whatsoever to that, that mug shot and what you would expect I mean, he got up on his feet today representing himself inside that courtroom and sounded like a little bit like a lawyer, maybe a lot like a lawyer. Uh, Matt Johnson, Court TV crime and justice correspondent, uh, takes a look at the big moments from today. Hi, Vinny. The Treehouse murder trial is underway in Florida. This defendant representing himself pro se. And right out the gate, he faced his arresting officer. Why do they call this, this residence the treehouse? So um, it was legit a treehouse. It was almost like a outdoor platform tower. I believe there was two levels um, and stairs going up all the way to the top. Did you have any other uh, parts of this investigation beyond those initial days? Um, yes, a, a few days later. Okay, a few days later, and... I was on shift again, and I got called to assist with arresting you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, eh, whatever. I'm not going to hold it against you. Prosecutors say that Tucker went to the treehouse with Rory Wilson to rob Paula Belmont. As she was being held at knife point, the victim, Matthew Bonnet, rushed over to help and was fatally stabbed five times. A neighbor, Mr. Matthew Bonnet, heard the screams and decided to render aid, or at least try to assist in somehow. As he was coming up the stairs, the evidence will show that the Mr. Tucker and Mr. Wilson confronted him. There was a struggle that ensued, and Mr. Bonnet was stabbed numerous times and eventually died from these injuries. Defendant Tucker told the jury that he was not at the treehouse. None of his DNA was recovered, and the key witnesses can't place him at the murder scene. That was quite the story. But the problem is, is nothing in that story tells you what evidence they have, what evidence they're going to show. Now, how are they going to actually tie me into that story? Um, anyway, you know, the prosecution, you know, tells that story, but the problem is very little of that story is true. That's the bottom line. And, you know, yes, about the only thing that was true in that story is, yes, John Travis Johnson was there. We're going to, you know, put on the surviving victim, Ms. Paula Bellamont, who says, 100% sure, wasn't me that night. 100%.
Now, just as Mr. Alvarez said, you know, this is a woman who was brutally beaten, robbed, had her throat slit, you know, literally sat there and watched her friend get murdered viciously. But yet she is testifying on my side. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, what motivation could she have? But now that key witness might not even testify. She's in the hospital, so a judge will later decide if she can testify via Zoom. The jury did hear, however, from another survivor of that deadly attack during day one of testimony. At some point, you said something happened, right? Yes, something happened. All right, well, let's tell the jury what happened. Uh, two guys came up the steps, looked around the corner, they were wearing, they were wearing a skull mask, and they came up, and they, I stood up, nailed, one of them nailed me, knocked me right back into the chair. And Vinnie Tucker is facing life behind bars if convicted. Testimony resumes tomorrow. Vinnie. All right, let's talk about this amazing transformation. Like, you look at the mugshot, you look at the allegations, and this is all taking place down in Key West, right? So he's kind of like drifted down to Florida. Um, there he is, right? That looks like someone who could potentially be a killer, right? Then you look at the guy in the courtroom, and you hear him, and he sounds like a lawyer. Also sounds like he could be doing voiceover work, for goodness sake. Um, and he married a millionaire. His, you know, the, the, the co-founder of, of CrossFit is his wife. Um, his life seems to have been completely turned around from the, at least that mugshot. Um, Kirk, Nermy, what do you think about how the jury is going to take all this in? Because they're going to hear a lot from this defendant because he's representing himself. Yeah, I mean, as far as somebody is representing himself, he's doing a great job of pointing out the, the failures of the state's case. And let's face it, when it comes to the state's case, there are many failures. There are many holes. I mean, we have the surviving victim on the stand today. And, you know, he talked about going in and being intoxicated. He talked about the two men being, you know, wearing masks what have you, trying to take money. He did not identify the defendant. If the defendant's correct, Mr. Tucker's correct, that there's no DNA, nothing else tying him to this case. It's hard to understand how the, the state is going to be able to tie him to it because right now, I mean, I would have a tough time, any juror I think would have a tough time convicting this man of murder, especially in the way he's presenting himself, right? They're gonna get to know him, as you said. They're gonna get to know him on a different level, not as the defendant, but as, the man standing up talking to him, it's going to be pretty hard for them to sentence him to convict him of murder when there's really no evidence other than testimony that this event happened, not that he was associated with it. Nima, does this man have a fool for a client or is he crazy like a fox? Vinny, I think he's crazy like a fox. You know, I turned this on today and I expected to see a train wreck. You know, these pro se defendants, I thought it's, this is gonna be another Darrell Brooks. And I was shocked. I mean, here's someone who's articulate, you know, he's using a laptop, he's overcoming objections, he's objecting. I mean, I don't know what's happened in the past six and a half years, but maybe this is someone who got a, you know, a law degree in prison or outside of prison, but I mean- No, he he's out on bond. Outstanding. He's out yeah, on bond. I mean, He's got his yeah, wife he's, has millions and millions of dollars and a couple of, of those million were used to get him out. Maybe he's doing the Kim Kardashian apprenticeship program and all of a sudden he's a lawyer. But I mean, he was very, very good. I was shocked. And normally as a prosecutor, you know, you're licking your chops expecting a layup. But I don't think it's going to be that case in yeah. this particular case. You know, Eklund, the other part of this is many times in many cases, the jury really doesn't get to know the defendant. Right. Because they don't testify. They just kind of sit there and a lot of times sit there kind of awkwardly, right? Sometimes they yeah. testify for a month, but that's, that's the exception. Yeah. Um, but they're going to know this guy. I mean, he is there yeah. and he's like, and, and just his, the way he speaks, the way his voice sounds, the composure that he has there is, is sending subliminal uh, messages to this jury, I think. Absolutely. And um, I think that he's in a beautiful position. You have uh, Mr. Tucker, who has the intelligence, 
the time because he was bonded out and the finances. So he can literally spend every waking moment dedicated to this case, to his case. And he has the resources and you can see that. With every witness, he is showing his demeanor. He is showing his calm, cool and collectiveness. Um, he is being, he is literally being the opposite of what the prosecution is accusing him of doing with different people. So he is, it. He should be studied. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I have had the pleasure of watching a few um, pro se trials um, just like these. And when I tell you, it is a masterpiece of just being yourself, showing your intelligence and forcing the prosecution to hold up their burden. And I think he's doing an excellent job. Now, obviously, I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. But two things come to mind here, Kirk. Like one... You know, if he's wrongfully accused, then we'll see what happens here. Um, but if he actually did it, right? And again, prosecutors have to prove it. But regardless of that fact, if he actually committed this crime, I think the biggest mistake he made was not reconnecting with his high school sweetheart a little bit earlier. Because, you know, what we're seeing in court now is, is the turnaround of his life with her. Right? Like, it, right after he gets arrested, all this happens. That's when he reconnects and all of that happens. Like, if he actually did this and, and is, is, you know, I don't know if they can prove it, but if he actually did this, the mistake he made was not connecting with her earlier. Well, you know, look, that's, that's a big if, Vinny, but I think your question and your comment highlight that difference, what Eklund was talking about. I mean, there is that message there that this, here's this guy, he's articulate, he's together, he probably had some coaching going on back at home, maybe he's doing the CrossFit, he looks entirely different, and that's going to serve him well as a defense because we do tend to think about you know, in 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 a in a particularly a crime like this, right? You think he's going to be an addict. You think he's friends with addicts. This is a, a drug rip, what have you? And he's anything but that. And that is going to serve him so well, whether it's with this case and and sentencing and whatever happens moving forward. But right now, he's showing everything that relates to him being inconsistent with a man who would commit this crime and likely headed towards a not guilty verdict. All right, we shall see, number one, if profs, prosecutors can prove it and, and what his testimony will be like when and if he takes the stand and is cross-examined. But he has an advantage. He almost doesn't have to testify. The, he can sort of do that just by the way he asks the questions. All right, stay where you are, folks. Up next. Will this trial ever happen? Sarah Boone accused of locking her boyfriend in a suitcase and taunting him while he died. Tonight, the latest. I was awakened by my brother screaming. Was pounding on the door, bang, bang, bang. People don't realize human beings like that can exist in the world. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. They were not gonna let me go easily. You better fight and you better get out of here. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight at 10, 9 central on Court TV. The problem is, is I fell asleep. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning. When I found it. Before you called? Yes! <laughs> One o'clock right now. I tried, I was awake, but I actually got out of the bed at like 12.30ish, whatever. So I came downstairs okay, and I was like, oh, he's in the suitcase still. That's Sarah Boone. We've been tracking this case for quite some time. That's the moment with the officer who responds where she's talking about um, her, her boyfriend, George Torres, who was locked in a suitcase all night long, all night long. These two had a, a bit of a toxic relationship as well. Um, and he ended up dying inside of a suitcase. Now she called 911 originally saying they were playing hide and seek. Uh, it's not clear what was going on. She told a couple different stories, uh, but then investigators took a look at her cell phone and on her cell phone, is her 
speaking to and taunting uh, George while she's recording it all. It's bizarre. He's inside a suitcase uh, begging for his life. I'm going to show you uh, that video. And, and it's, it's difficult to look at, but it's the most important evidence in the case because it shows what was happening at the moment he is begging her to just let him out, that he can't breathe. Um, so we're going to take a look at it right now. I've given you the warning. If you don't want to hear it, you can turn down the volume. If you don't want to see it, uh, it's about two minutes worth of video. Let's take a look. Sarah. For everything you've done to me. Sarah. For everything you've done to me. Sarah. F you. Sarah. F you. Sarah. <laughs> Stupid. Sarah. That's my name. Don't wear it up. I can't breathe, babe. Seriously. Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. Sarah. 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 Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. <laughs> it's on you. Sarah. Reel around some. Might want to get a video for it extra. Because <laughs> I got this. Sarah. Reel around some. Sarah. I can't breathe, babe. Oh. That's what Sarah. I feel like when you chewing on me. Sarah. F you. I can't breathe, Sarah. Yeah. You should probably shut the Sarah. up. Sarah. Shh. And once investigators found that video, the whole nature of the case changed. Now, pretrial hearing coming up on January 16th. The trial once again, once again, scheduled for January 26th. Um, take a look at this video. This is the last time that she was in court uh, when she was um, approved to get her seventh attorney, uh, which led to their trial getting postponed for the 13th time. Um, the first 12 postponements took place from July 27th of 2020 to July of 2023. 12 times it's postponed over the course of three years. And you talk about, and it's all happening because she keeps getting new attorneys, new attorneys. These attorneys are finding it impossible to work with her. So let's bring back in our think tank, Ekla Mercy, Kirk Nurmi, and Nima Romani. Um, so here we are. Let me ask you about the trial, if, if this thing ever happens. How important is the fact, and these are all the postponements and cancellations that we've had, how important is it, Nima, um, when you talk about how he got inside of that suitcase? I can't imagine, I mean, he had to voluntarily get in there, I would think. I don't think he could zip himself in there, but... I don't know. How important is that fact, and, and will it play a role in all of this? Well, Vinny, it's an interesting legal argument, but it's not going to carry the day. It's not a civil case, right? So it's a criminal case, and the question is, did Boone have a duty to act? Well, she zipped him up, so once you put someone in danger, that puts the duty on you to save the person from danger. So, you know, I'm sure the appellate lawyers will love it, but this is really an indefensible case. You know, criminal defendants lie all the time, but video doesn't lie. So Sarah Boone is gonna be convicted. And I think the lesson of the show is, you know, poor Jorge Torres to be in a relationship with someone like this, you know, Christian Obenselli, same thing, toxic relationship. And they see Tucker, maybe he turned his life around by ending up with the right person. But I don't see how any attorney can defend this case. I thought Boone would be, 
the next pro se defendant here on court TV, but apparently she found some poor lawyer that's going to take this case and throw up a Hail Mary, and we'll see uh, if there's any chance of her maybe picking up one or two jurors here. And we've also heard, Eklund, <clears throat> through the years now, that uh, one of the potential defenses might be that she's a battered woman. <laughs> that it's going to be, uh, the, the, the relationship is very volatile, <laughs> it's very toxic, uh, she's been uh, beaten by him, she's been strangled by him, and, and this is what uh, the result was. Uh, yeah, I, she can't use that. I think um, the video is damning and any, um, all I would have to do is just play that video. And by the third Sarah in which the victim is calling your name, you lose any defenses. Um, he is constantly calling for help. He is act. He is advocating for his help, and you denied it. So if she, the issue is, I've I've actually um, represented clients like that. The problem is, is that you have a, a you have a defendant who the only thing that she's waiting for you to say is how to get out of prison. That's it. You have to make, she is just waiting for her, she is waiting for an answer to get out. So any attorney who cannot tell her how to get out, she is going to fire. So I think that the um, judge at this point needs to make a judgment call on how many more postponements because she's going to do this until the end of time. Um, Kirk Nurmi, you know something about representing uh, difficult clients. Uh, what are your thoughts here? I'm stunned that she's been allowed to go through so many lawyers. I think lawyer number six, we heard in that clip, you're talking about her demeaning response to him. She couldn't keep going with the representation. If that's the standard, everybody could just yell at their public defender and they get a new attorney and they never get convicted. Ultimately, the judge needs to draw the line here. Eklund's right in terms of this case. I think about it. You know, if I was going in there talking to Sarah, I'd say, listen, the, the the evidence is all on this tape. It's all on this two minutes. You're going to get convicted. The jury is going to loathe you. You can go out. You can certainly go up on the stand and say, hey, I was a victim of all, of all this domestic abuse. They're not going to believe you because they saw you laughing and taking delight in this man's death. They are going to be tone deaf to whatever you're saying, and you're going to be convicted in an hour or less, and you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Each and every attorney she's had has probably told her some version of that story, yeah. and then she starts yelling and acting demeaning. See, Kirk is riled up. He knows how these people are. <laughs> up next. In tonight's Tank Takes, a man strikes a Subway employee with a sandwich when it's not cut in half. Tonight, we're asking the Think Tank, what kind of sandwich would be the best weapon? There was pounding on the door. Bang, bang, bang. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived. Next on Court TV. A Connecticut mother goes missing. Now, her estranged husband's girlfriend stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, only on Court TV. Welcome back. Time for tonight's Tank Takes, where we take a look at the world of crime and justice and some stories that we save for the end and put them all together. Still with us, our Think Tank, Eklund Mercy, Kirk Nermi, Nima Romani. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. ready. Let's get to our first one, staying in, in the theme of tonight's program, train wreck relationship. So a man who apparently was under the influence a little bit of alcohol crashes his car on some train tracks after hitting a switch and blames a mystery woman who he says was actually behind the wheel. It was a woman he had met at the bar. Um, apparently, though, they could not find this mystery woman. Luckily, the train's conductor, though, was able to successfully maneuver an emergency stop to avoid this collision. My question tonight, Nima, who's more elusive, that mystery woman or the train conductor? Oh, I think that mystery woman, I think she was probably an OnlyFans model, Vinny, and that's why we can't find her. <laughs> uh, Kirk, your thoughts about this one? Well, you know, I'm old enough to remember the old Jimmy Buffett song, I think this guy was wasting away in Margaritaville and looking for a woman to blame. 
All right, let's get to our next story. Another couple. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, this one I'm calling Holiday Tradition. A woman has been charged with a uh, battery with a deadly weapon after she allegedly hit her boyfriend in the head with a glass vase on New Year's Day. This is the same woman who just one week prior on Christmas Eve was arrested for allegedly beating the same man with a Christmas tree. Um, you know, as part of the intake process, she actually uh, was noted to have a, a tattoo which read, Think Positive. Here's my question, though, Eklund Mercy. Um, do you think this couple will last until Valentine's Day? Unfortunately, they do. Uh, it's something about toxic relationships. Um, you know, mental health is real, and <laughs> nothing about this is exciting. Nothing about this is exhilarating. People can get hurt. So I, I yeah, stop, stop, stop dating. Stop. Just Kurt, stop. do you think there's any coincidence that it's both times it happened on a holiday? Look, I don't know, Vinny. I've been married over 30 years. I haven't been beaten with a Christmas tree or a vase, so I'm going to take it as a win and uh, call it a day. All right, let's get to our final uh, story tonight. We're calling this one um, Beat Fresh. Uh, a Florida man, just happens to be from Florida, uh, has been arrested after assaulting a subway worker in a subway sandwich shop. Apparently, he was upset because... It wasn't because he got the wrong sub. It was because... The woman there didn't cut it in half before giving it to him, which uh, raised, and, and she's alleged to assaulted him with the actual sandwich, which brings us to tonight's question, Nima Romani, which is the worst sandwich to be assaulted with? Is it um, a Slappy Joe, a Spicy Kickin' Chicken, or a Rowdy Reuben? <laughs> Oh, Vinny, it's got to be that spicy chicken. I know. I thought you were going to go with the spicy Italian. I was going to say meatball marinara, <laughs> but that spicy chicken, I mean, that's going to hurt both ways, both when you're hit and on the way out. All right, Kirk Nermy, I know you wouldn't eat any of these, but which of them looks the most dangerous? Look, whichever one has mayonnaise on them, because, you know, cause some controversy, but no one should eat mayonnaise, so that'll kill you. So whatever one has mayo. <laughs> All right, Eglin Mercy, I'll give you the final word. I think people aren't afraid of hands. I think that there should be a third option, which is combat. What you're not going to do is slap me at my job. This whole um, customer is always right, and I get a sandwich in my face. We're fighting. This this needs to stop. I, needs to stop that, right now. You're going to slap me? For doing my job, exactly. We, there should be a third option: combat. We should be able to fight it out. Eklund Mercy, Kirk Nermi, Nima Romani. Thank you all so much. We'll see you again really, really soon. Uh, before we go tonight, folks, please take a look at your screens. We have a missing child. This is Genevieve Adams. Genevieve, just 16 years old, missing out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. If you see Genevieve, please pick up the phone. Call 911. 1-800-THE LOST or you can call the Bethlehem Police Department in Pennsylvania. That phone number is on the screen right now. Let's see if we can get Gen uh, Genevieve to a safe place tonight. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night, and as always, please don't forget to hug the kids.